This brings up a whole series of kind of fun little stories that philosophers tell, which, which have a bite. Uh, you've called them intuition pumps. Let's go, let's go through some of them and describe what they are quickly. Yeah. And then, and then okay. the first, which relates to what we were saying, are, are zombies. You've yeah. called it a zombie hunch. Uh, Dave Chalmers, among others, have been yeah. using this. Uh, yeah. uh, how does that work? Okay. Uh, a philosopher's zombie is not the zombie that you see in the horror film. It's right. a, 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 you might be a zombie. I might be a zombie. Right. A philosopher's zombie, by definition, has all of the cognitive and behavioral adroitness and swiftness and lovability and wittiness and all the rest. Every behaviorally identifiable feature of a human being is there, but there's nobody home. There's, <laughs> there's no consciousness inside. This is, we're supposed to be able to imagine this. Now, uh, I think, and the point being, and the that point is that since since there is a difference yes. between a normal conscious person and a philosopher zombie, the difference is what physicalism, what what a material naturalistic theory has a problem with. It's it's because right. there it seems to be something there extra. seems to be something extra, right. something missing. Now, uh, again, I think this is this is the the subtraction fallacy. Uh, uh, People say, well, I can imagine that. Well, how do you know? How do you know you can imagine that? I mean, so compare it with, with a, a simpler case. Somebody says, well, you know, I can imagine something which is atom for atom identical to a cat, a live cat, but it isn't alive. <laughs> it just seems to be alive. There it is, prowling around, purring, <laughs> eating, but it's not alive. I can imagine that. Well. Big deal. I mean, what does that prove? <laughs> that, that the life sciences have missed something? That there's élan vital? No, it just means that this is not a very good use of your imagination. This is, it's just, it's just a, it's sloppy is what that is. Now, the people who take zombies seriously are well aware of this objection. And they say, consciousness is different. It's not like life. Mm. Well, how? What exactly is this? Well, with consciousness, you you just know. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think you do. I think it's very strange to think about adjusting uh, all of physics, uh, splitting the universe in two, adding a whole other dimension or a whole other kind of stuff. Because... You can't get this little hunch out of your head. <laughs> Maybe your hunch is just a mistake. Maybe it's just a sort of cognitive tick. And uh, at least you should take that seriously. And, and what, what I uh, find most incredible is when my fellow philosophers, some of them, they, they consult their intuitions and they come up with this just unshakable intuition that there's a difference between a, a, a zombie and a normal conscious person and say, and therefore, <laughs> therefore, we've got to divide the, the, the natural sciences in two and add this other dimension. So, wow, imagine that such a little thought experiment could generate such an important result. I, I, I just find that... Um, uh, I guess preposterous is the right <laughs> word for that. All right, second one is uh, Mary, the color scientist. Yeah. Frank Jackson, a uh, very clever uh, uh, ingenious philosopher uh, from Australia, uh, had a, th a little thought experiment, another little intuition bump, yeah. a little story about this uh, Mary, the color scientist, and uh, by hypothesis, she's not just a good color scientist. She knows everything, not a lot, everything that could be known about the physical, natural nature of color and color experience, what goes on in the brain of people when they see colors, the way the light waves, blah, blah, blah. So she's got total physical knowledge from a scientific point of view about color. Hmm. I don't even know if we can imagine that, but suppose for the sake of the right. example that we can. Now, Mary has gained all this knowledge without ever seeing color because she's been kept in a, in a colorless environment. She's got white gloves on. And <laughs> she's in a black and white room. They don't, no mirrors and so forth. You have to, right. you have to tell a story yeah. a little bit right. very science fictionally. So now the idea is that then 
Mary knows everything there is physical to know about color. Wavelengths, uh, everything, yeah, yeah, how it yeah, affects yeah, the yeah, brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, read every book, but not just read every book that's been written so far, but she's, she's a great pioneer in color vision. She's got to, because she knows everything. She knows the final all. physics, the final physics, She knows everything. the final physics of color. Right. But she still doesn't know what it's like to see something red. So, so then one day her captors let her out and they show her a red rose and ah she's learned something has she learned something? well that's <laughs> uh, 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 jackson says it seems just obvious that mary learned yeah. something it sort of does it does i right i agree with it it seems obvious but is it in retrospect so obvious uh just as a test of that claim, I suggested imagining the experiment slightly different. In my telling, when they release Mary, they play a trick on her. And what they, the first colored object they show her is a blue banana. They've dyed a <laughs> banana blue and they show her a blue banana. Yeah. She takes one look at it and says, that's a blue banana you're trying to trick me. <laughs> well, could she do that or not? They have to say, those who are on Jackson, she couldn't do that. Well, who says she couldn't? Prove to me that she couldn't immediately see that they were tricking her. After all, she knows so much. Well, but how old could she ever use that information to, to anticipate what a blue banana looked like? Well, suppose that instead of color vision, we'd done something like um, tactile impressions and... Uh, uh, we never, ever, ever let her touch a triangle. <laughs> now, for the first time, we say, oh, here's a triangle, and we let her touch it, but we, we give her a, a square to touch. She says, that's not a triangle, <laughs> that's a square. Well, we have no trouble supposing that she can put her knowledge to use like that. Why are we so sure that in the case of color, it's different? Now, maybe it is, but what I want to draw out is that what Jackson's thought experiment does is it simply dramatizes the hunches with which we start. It doesn't mm -hmm. prove a darn thing. Yeah. And I think, in fact, those hunches are just mistaken. So I've tried to show how, in some detail, Mary could figure out what any color was going to look like to her yeah. so that when she saw the blue banana, she'd say, yeah, trying to <laughs> trick me, eh? <laughs> If she saw a red rose, she said, yeah, right, red rose. <laughs> I already figured that out long ago. Now, maybe that's not possible, but the burden of proof has surely got to be mm. on those who put these forward to show why <laughs> it's not possible. You can't just say the way Jackson does, it seems just obvious. <laughs> that's, that's no way to conduct a, a scientific investigation. How about John Searle's Chinese Room? Yeah, that's, that's the thought experiment which inspired me to create the term intuition pump. Um, what's an intuition pump? It's a very cleverly constructed device which is designed to provoke a certain table thumping <laughs> response. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, right. Got to be that way. It pumps an intuition. So uh, John Searle has this little story about how this is to prove that strong AI, strong artificial intelligence is impossible, that we could never make a computer program that was conscious, that, that really thought. And the proof runs like this. Um, first of all, we imagine that, this is a reductio ad absurdum proof, we imagine a program has been written that ex hypothesi, it can pass the Turing test. It's, it's, it's the, the triumphant product of artificial intelligence. They, they say this. Can't, really you works. can't distinguish it from a human That's being. Right, no, right. Impossible. It's, so. So now he says, well, it's just a computer program, so I can hand simulate that program. So instead of the computer, you just put me in the room, it's just the Chinese room, and you give me the code to execute, and I just <laughs> sit in there executing the code, and uh, the Chinese symbols, oh, the, 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 the Chinese part of this, which I forgot to mention, <laughs> is that this is a program for having a conversation in Chinese. <laughs> Right. And what Sir wants to say is the computer doesn't understand Chinese. It's it's a great conversationalist in Chinese. Good company. You know, Chinese <laughs> people enjoy 
its interactions, but, that, but the computer doesn't really understand Chinese. And the proof of that is that he, Searle, could take the place of the computer and could hand simulate the program. Because he has the rules. Because he has the rules. He has, what's a program? It's just a whole lot of rules. Right. It's just a whole lot of, of instructions. He would just obey all the instructions. And so in would come Chinese symbols. Yeah. And he would look at the table to see what he was supposed to do when those, and he would do all those things. And then he would output Chinese symbols. But he would be clueless. He wouldn't <laughs> know what was going on. And since there's nobody else in there, there's no understanding of Chinese because Searle is doing it and he doesn't understand Chinese. Right, right. Um, it has a certain charm, yeah. I'm sure. But it's, it's an, I think it's an unwitting sleight of hand. Searle is simply looking in the wrong place. Uh, it's not that the AI people say that the the CPU, the central processing unit, the thing that's executing all the instructions, that it understands Chinese. That would be preposterous. It doesn't understand anything. It just executes a set of very simple instructions. It's the whole system, which is gigantic, that understands yeah. Chinese. Well, now, how could a system understand something? Well, that's... A very good question, and we can talk about that. But when Searle says, look, I don't understand Chinese when I'm the system, but he isn't the system. He's just the tiny little part. He's the CPU that is executing the system. And he hasn't a clue what the whole system is doing. Suppose, yeah. suppose that when uh, the Chinese conversation is going on, suppose that a uh, uh, Chinese person um, tells a joke. And the joke depends on uh, the hearer imagining something and then using visual imagination to see the point of the joke. Well, when that, those Chinese symbols come in, Searle follows directions and he performs, let's say conservatively, a few trillion operations, <laughs> which are just arithmetic. That's what a CPU does. And eventually it yields some Chinese symbols. He doesn't know what they mean. He spits them out. And the Chinese person says, well, that's very interesting. This person understood the joke just fine. And not, not only that, but explain to me how he imagined the situation and how amusing it was that my <laughs> joke caused him to imagine this way. Well, Cyril would know nothing about that. But that happened. Mm. And Cyril but simply had no access to all of this processing going on in the system. Now, can the system understand? Well, Searle's lack of understanding when he's in the engine room there says nothing about whether there's understanding going on inside there. 